No, okay, so we'll in the path. Good luck moving around a tiny bit over or close to the end. So now we're getting reorganized in the room and we'll call this meeting to order. Uh, we'll start off with the roll call, Shelly. Okay. And, and everyone's just the advice is going to be recorded and posted publicly. So I think it said audio uh, viewed on the chat or if your camera's going out to film that may become part of the recording. Uh, Amber Rice. Present. Brian Smith. Present. Jason Johnson. Yes. Chris Long. Present. Kyle Henson. Present. Matt Shaw. Present. Orlando Alfredo. Present. Sandy Nightguard. Present. Sharon Hollingsworth. Present. Phoebe Merrill. Present. Sorry about that. I'm here. Thank you. Troy Hope. We have Tammy Quorum. Thank you, Billy. All right. Moving on, Chairman's report, uh, attachment 3A in your package is the attendance report. Just a reminder if you um, missed uh, more than two consecutive meetings, the Bureau will reach out and uh, inquire as to whether or not you want to be on the committee further. Uh, next item, we have a new member to our committee. It's Kyle Henson uh, from AIM and the Central Region. So thank you, Kyle, for joining us. It's been helpful in some of our uh, recent uh, work groups. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Uh, vacancy report is next. Uh, we do have one vacancy for a Chiefs representative. So send uh, your um, information to Aubriana Smith if uh, you are interested in the vacancy. Uh, moving on to the bureau report, Gail. All right. I will do my best to uh, cover for Chief Garcia, who is out today. So I will go through this uh, relatively quickly since we covered it previously. Uh, just covering our top priorities for 2024. Uh, we are going to be working on our continued need assessment strategic plan, ongoing rulemaking, uh, our procurement for the AS uh, trauma registry. Uh, continue to promote our time sensitive illness injury program and then alternative destinations for behavioral health. Uh, this is just an update on the practice strategy plan. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the timeline for this. So uh, we are currently finalizing uh, some chief assessment survey reports. So thank you for everyone who participated in that process of the past year. Uh, in April, we will be ho uh, hosting a strategic planning summit. Uh, and in September, we will uh, produce for EMS California staff a draft strategic plan for approval, as uh, which will then publish this and start implementation in January 2025 for the next five years. Uh, save the date. This is just the upcoming spring uh, strategic planning summit that will be held here in person. April 10th, we will also have a virtual option. So those who attend in person, we will have lunch available, which will be from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. A reminder that we do have the EMPT of the Year Award. So last year was the first year that we uh, awarded this at our main EMF uh, council meeting. And it was really one of the, the kind of most memorable EMF council meetings that I've been at in over 15 years. So uh, we are excited to do this again. We have extended the nomination period. We want to make sure that people have time to continue to nominate. Uh, so you have until March 31st to do the nomination. That gives everyone time to uh, vote on those at the regional council level. Uh, we also have our trauma center awards and this is a new uh, new one we try to do this but this is a little bit more complicated uh, just because of the structure of the trauma centers versus our four regional council so these are the categories that you can hear uh, we will have those nominations be uh, reviewed by city that will not be just zero uh, review of the uh, award and that will be distributed as staff in may as well so we're really excited to see that coming award uh, just nice to take some time to recognize uh, all the work that everyone does to support our EMS trauma system across the state. Is there a deadline for that one? The March, 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 March 31st. March 31st for both of that. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, just a quick update on our rulemaking process. Uh, we have completed four rulemakings in the past uh, since about three, uh, two years now. You can see those most recently, the ground animal rule uh, finalized. And we have pending rulemaking regarding EMS certification and training and scope of practice. Uh, the next step in the rulemaking process will uh, continue to have work groups and special meeting sessions regarding critical care endorsement for paramedics as well as PMR. 
And then also we will have some work on the interfacility transfer reporting requirement. Uh, if you're uh, not on our gut delivery system, that's how we send out all notification about update, uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, please make sure you sign up for that. If you have any questions, you can let Shelly know and she can help show, uh, show you where to find out that communication. Um, brief additional updates, federal updates. Uh, just an update on the SHARE program. We are really excited as we have continued our transition from the University of Arizona to ADHS from the data set. So the AED and data registry sites are both now live on our website. You can see the links here. We will make these slide deck available after the meeting. Uh, if you have any questions about SHARE, please reach out to either Julia Benton or Adam Rodriguez for that. And a lot to leave behind. I'm really excited uh, to share. Uh, thank you for Dave Hanson for all the work uh, on this program. We have now trained uh, 2,139 CNTs and paramedics in states. We have 29 agencies enrolled. We have shipped uh, 1,336 kits, and we have 99 tag scans. What the 99 tag scan means is that as someone has taken the actual Naloxone no Leave Behind kit and they have the QR code as they've given that out to the community. We recognize that there's probably additional kits that have to be distributed where someone's given the kit, if they get scan the QR code, it's okay. As long as we're getting the Narcan out there, we punish the data that, that is a backup available for that. So excited to see such great participation in the program. If your agency is not yet participating and you would like to, uh, Dave Tamp's email is on here and please reach out to him and we just help make that available to you. Uh, we also have some information uh, as some additional uh, videos that was set out by the Office of Injury Prevention uh, regarding naloxone saving lives. This is a big initiative for the Department of Health Services, and there's more information available on the general website for ADHS slash opioid. The National Registry updates, I won't go through all of this. I will just highlight the big thing. We do have representatives National Registry that will be available later in the meeting to speak as well. Uh, but just a big reminder for anyone who uh, it's in a paramedic program currently. The current psychomotor test sunsets at June 30th. So if you have a student that is participating in the program in June, uh, if they wait until July 1st to take their psychomotor exam, they will be taking the new format. Uh, so just really important that students kind of be aware of where they are in their process uh, and not maybe postpone that if they want to take it. Separate. There's probably a few more options for practice available. So uh, just a reminder about that. Uh, that is a hard deadline that by National Registry to July 1st, it will only be the new format for that exam. Uh, ASTR uh, registry update. Uh, I think this is just a reminder of the process. Carissa covered this uh, in our CHEPI meeting. Uh, so the RFP process is in uh, kind of going ongoing for ADHS. Uh, this is hoping to uh, be posted by the end of this month. Uh, be completed by July 1st of this year, and the goals of the new trauma registry will be implementation July 1st, 2025, because the current vendor is funding. So, uh, just a reminder, we are getting close to starting that RFP process. Uh, two reminders on our dashboards. We just like to share all the work that Boston and her team have done putting together our data dashboard. Uh, we did present in our last uh, meeting some updates on a new dashboard based on fall. Uh, and really amazing work and came from the request that we have from State Trauma Advisory Board, as well as Techie, really wanting specific data about hip injuries, fall injuries, ground level falls versus falls from height, and trauma versus non trauma patient population. All right, thank you. Uh, next, I would like to welcome several new staff members to the Bureau. Uh, first is Karen Warren, our uh, CRS auditor, uh, Dave Hansen, who is our FRCAR Grants Project Coordinator, Mike Hamilton, who is our Senior GIS uh, Analyst, Mitch Adair is a new investigator, and Jeff Graff, also a new investigator in our Enforcement Division. Great. And I think I have covered naloxone lead behind. And uh, Stephanie, are you on the line? Hello. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey there. Um, it's nice to meet everyone. Thank you all so much for having me on the call today. I also have Stephen Wilson from the registry who is here with any questions. Um, I am the new stakeholder program manager for your state. So it's um, great to meet everyone. And I know it got mentioned before, but just the reminder that the ALS redesign is happening on July 1st, and there is a slight fee increase with that. Um, it goes up, it's about 12 to $17 there. Um, so just to keep those on your radar, um, I'll also link the key initiatives link into the chat, as well as my email address for any questions um, that you may have that you wanna follow up with, but it's great. Um, thank you all again for having us.
And I'll just, uh, this is Stephen. I'll just take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Stephen Wilson, I'm the director of the stakeholder relations team for the National Registry. Um, happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Any questions for anyone? All right, sharing so none, we will move on. It's uh, Julia, I'll have left you. Sorry, signing. Um, Dr. Bradley really talks about this already, but um, just wanted to provide a quick um, plug for our uh, strategic planning permit on April 10th. Um, thank you so much for everyone that participated in the survey this far or a focus group. Um, we really look forward to continuing the process. And um, at this meeting, we're hoping to get some priorities and objectives um, nailed down for our strategic plan. Um, so please feel free to reach out if you'd like any more and if you'd like additional information and i am happy to provide that to you all right great thank you gail very much uh moving on to our discussion and action items there is a long list here so i'll try to move quickly today uh the first action item is to discuss and approve the draft minutes from november 16th this is attached to 5a Shelly has them up. We'll briefly scroll through them and then I can take a motion to accept. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any Motion passes. Next item, discuss them and approve the draft minutes from the March 14th special meetings. I have a motion to discuss this one. So moved. Yes. Second. All right. So these are from uh, March. Which meeting was this, Shelly? The special meeting. Right. Talked about. Well, the one we just had. <laughs> <laughs> I already erased it from my brain. Sorry. Um, is there a this is Orlando? Is there a follow up on this special meeting? Are we going to do this again, or is this going to be discussed today, or no? Uh, it's on today's agenda as well. Yeah, if, the, if we have time, we will uh, try to get to that in today's agenda. I believe that the new, uh, and with feedback from the committee, the new draft rules will be posted. Hopefully, I'm looking at Roseanne, I think within the next week for public comment. As long as uh, we can uh, uh, discuss within internally and um, uh, come up with whatever revisions we want to make, the uh, new draft will be posted. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion on this one? I have not a call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any votes in time? Taft is moving on to item C. Discuss the of the draft training for EMDT uh, for fall prevention. This is attachment 5C. Do I have a motion to discuss? So moved. Brian. Brian. Thank you. All right. So in your packet is the draft of the fall prevention training. We had two or three work groups meeting to um, discuss and finalize this training. Um, if you look here, it really is just to talk about um, pre-hospital uh, treatment of falls and pre-hospital awareness of uh, fall injuries and, and ways to look out for um, those that may be at risk. Most of us containing Shelly will scroll through. As you guys look in your packet, you can let me know if you see anything else. Is it missing from your packet? Yes. Shelly, which attachment is that by number? Uh, it is attachment 5C. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. 
The training goes mostly through some falls and demographics, um, discusses home risk assessment. Some tips for fall reductions, looking at different hazards and risks. Looking at medical comorbidities and medications that may lead to a higher risk of fall. Was this developed by uh, just for historical background? Was this developed by a committee or by a, a AZDHS specifically? It's a great document. It was a one of our work groups. So work groups, a work group formed out of this committee. Uh, we spent a couple of days going over some PowerPoint. Great, thanks. And then some stuff in the end about refusal, which we uh, mostly stole from the refusal training. Of. And in the PowerPoint version, there are speaker notes come in uh, with many of the slides to just get some additional information if you're giving this thought so that kind of have a little bit more knowledge of the background of it. So, and uh, just a little history, big thank you to the committee for taking this on. This has been a request from SAB uh, to really have an education aimed at uh, fall injuries and fall prevention uh, for the EMS environment. And I know this was kind of a little hesitant, and, and I kind of said, please do it. <laughs> I've done a lot of this, this part of this lecture uh, with the community care medicine units and found it very successful. But really, a lot of the work that's uh, is done by those units is actually done by many 911 responders uh, that they actually don't think about this as what what they do but really it's part of the normal stuff that it also occurs where people are helping someone in their home environment who may have a fault or them. So yeah, they think thank you to the group to putting this together. Yeah, I think the benefit is a lot of these lectures for pre hospital providers are sometimes given by trauma groups who are looking to go out and, and do teaching and community involvement activities as part of their as part of their trauma center. Um, and this provides them a way to do that. Uh, in a way that is EMS centered versus more generalized. So, yeah, thank you to the work group that came together and helped me out. All right, any comments or discussion? This page is from there twice. It says situational understanding. Back in the refusable area, there's like two different areas where this one is. Okay, thanks. Then I have another note that I have to remember if I can figure out what I was talking to myself about. It seems like there's some redundancy in the refusal area going over kind of the same stuff on different pages, but. Okay. Um, you were on the twerk group, Brian. You were supposed to help. I was on the twerk group. Did you on this one? No. no. I thought you were. Sorry. Well, but from now on, you must be on all work groups. <laughs> I like this not being a PC slide. So yeah, situational understanding of their play. We can take that out. And I did this yeah, on this one assessing cognition orientation down the right hand corner, it talks about the and old time scores not equal decision making mm -hmm. but then there's a big one on the next one so i don't know if that was intended to oh uh, yeah have that on i think it was just or if that was in the reminders to, reminder to do something else to we do the next play. page yeah maybe we can strike that off of this page and just leave the second slide I think that was it. I think that's it, I guess. Okay. All right. We've noted those, Brian. Thank you.
Oh, I know what it was. Um, there's a where this risk of refusal after a fall and in the situational understanding, there's a page called action items take away from training. Mm -hmm. And then there's a page that says risk to EMS agencies and providers. And it talks about patient refusals there, but it seems like the risk of refusals and maybe the next one should go after that page instead of before it does it like. You have risk of refusal after the fall and, and the situational page, and then you come back and have risk EMS agencies and providers. Yeah, I think if we take that situational understanding one out, the first one, that probably just got flipped in there accidentally. But then it goes risk of refusal after fall. Oh, yeah. It then risk to EMS agencies and then action items. Is that what like the risk to EMS agencies and providers should come first, and then it goes into the risk of refusal after the fall and whatever other order the situational awareness you guys meant to be in there. Okay. I'm okay with that. Thanks. Uh, I got part of it. So I got that cut off. I got another piece. You said you wanted to delete the first situational release that one. And then we keep, so we have risk ownership until after call. And then, before that, those risk to EMS agencies and providers. Okay. So Which those? Yeah. 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 There's some page numbers on here, and I tried to look for slide numbers on the PDF, and it didn't, it didn't come up. So. And what is really fun about putting in here, um, not just that, you know, and next to like the blood thinners, the um, conditions that potentially the patient uh, would have in order to be on those, because they don't always know how uh, rest are involved in that. Uh, blood thinners. Yeah, so it's just like that. Ask about the medication specifically, but they don't always know the medication and maybe it's the crew something that they don't necessarily know. So, um, I did one recently where I actually put conditions that was required or that the patient would have, like, it's a, they're going to probably be on a, on a, yes, anti flag. And there we are, the, 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 um, trauma. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we were trying to keep it super simple and not like too much medical stuff in here. I think was the goal. I just did a very simple list, you know, just one, two, three. But these are the conditions that potentially they would be on a some sort of blood center. I'm happy to send it. Yeah, I'm okay with the addition. Okay. We may have to bring back to the office. We have a look at just practice standpoint. I think see the goal of this is really kind of for fall prevention. And uh, I think if we don't have a, a list of medications that you're seeing, they're on one, which phase kind of points you in the wrong direction from a patient perspective. So you don't know for sure if they're on a blood thinner, just because they're in ACEs, what if it's two ACEs and they've not been in, in that book or not on a blood thinner. But I don't know that I would necessarily include that as a baseline for a fall in, like fall prevention. This is really kind of a fall prevention training. Thanks, mm -hmm. yes. Any other comments? Hearing none, I can uh, take this one to a vote. Uh, with the recommended changes from Brian. Do I need another motion for that? Oh, okay. this is sitting up. Okay. okay. All right. So um with the changes recommended so far, um do we have let's call for a vote. So all in favor of accepting say aye. 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 Trying to figure out what I was trying to say. <laughs> all all opposed saying don't mess me up. No. All right, motion that. And that was there. Uh, next item, uh, discuss, uh, this is the discussion item, Gail, yeah, correct? This is, yeah, this is not true adding to, to the or discuss and approve, got it. Uh, 
that this would be without amendment. So uh, adding the Alzheimer's Association coaching Alzheimer's first responder training to our independent study webpage. So if you see here, there's a link to the study webpage. Um, if you create an account in here, uh, it gives you access to the training. Uh, the training is on a web page, and I don't believe there's a, you know, obviously any ability for us to make any changes to it. So it would be just as accepted. So do I have a motion to discuss this item? So Thank you. And I think we have representatives online that organization. Oh, great. Yes. You can click on the link and then we'll open it up to, I'm not sure if we, we have, have to, we have to register. Yeah, I went and tried to look at it yesterday and I have ran out of time before I could get registered to go through it all, but it does offer CE and stuff. And I see Tori on the line. I see uh, Tori, if you would like to share your screen. <laughs> Yes. Yes. The bottom center of the screen should be oh, your mute right. button there as well for your audio. Sorry there. I I had shared my screen and I was like, how do I get back to the meet? How's everyone doing? <laughs> Um, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share some information with you today. My name is Tori Roberg. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Alzheimer's Association, Desert Southwest Chapter. Um, also on the line is Jody Codem, and I'll introduce, I'll have her speak in just a minute. She's one of our Community Engagement Coordinators, and she is here on behalf of Kinsey McManus, who is our Programs Director. Originally, she was going to be here today to present this to you, but um, she is on vacation, so good for her, right? <laughs> um, let me just give you a brief, um, I just want to give you a brief overview of our facts of Alzheimer's in Arizona before we go into the training. Um, just the other day, Tuesday, we released our annual facts and figures report, which can be found on our website. But to give you an update, we're looking at it looks like we have about 151,500 people age 65 and older living with Alzheimer's in Arizona. That's 11% of your adults over the age of 65. And this disease can also affect people under the age of 65. It is less common, but it does, it, it definitely happens. It's called early onset, but we focus our, um, our big number on age 65 and older. Um, we know people living with Alzheimer's have a lot of interactions with EMS, and uh, so the association has put together this training, and I am going to pass this over to Jody to tell you a little more about the training. Jody? Good morning. Good morning. People with Alzheimer's and related dementias and their families and friends can feel overwhelmed, but no one needs to go on this journey alone. We offer a variety of free programs, services, and resources to help cope with all aspects of the disease and its progression. The Alzheimer's Association Desert Southwest Chapter provides services to the Arizona and Southern Nevada communities. Our support groups are led by trained professionals and are offered regularly. Our education programs for the general public, both online and in person, feature information on topics such as diagnosis, warning signs, communication, living with Alzheimer's disease, and caregiving techniques. Our helpline is available whenever and wherever you need us. And we encourage anybody uh, affected or professionally or personally to please have that helpline number stored in your phone because you'll never know when you're going to need it. Next slide, please. If you encounter a person living with dementia in the community, would you know how to appropriately adjust your approach? A person living with dementia may be easily agitated or afraid. As a first responder, it's critical to understand how to best approach situations involving someone living with dementia. Approaching Alzheimer's first responder training program is a free online training that will help prepare you to respond to common calls involving a person living with dementia. Now we'd like to play a short video for you. 
just a moment. I'm going to pull up the YouTube. Where did it go? Okay. More than 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. Most live at home, in the communities where you protect and serve. If you encountered a person with dementia... Hold on one second. I'm going to make it... It doesn't seem to be playing right on my end, so let me make it bigger if I can. For you. There we go. Can everyone see that okay? I'm just going to start it from the beginning for you. It's only a minute, 21 seconds. More than 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. Most live at home, in the communities where you protect and serve. If you encountered a person with dementia, would you know how to appropriately adjust your approach? With input from first responders, the Alzheimer's Association developed Approaching Alzheimer's First Responder Training. This free online course prepares you to identify the disease and efficiently and effectively respond to common calls involving a person with dementia. Approaching Alzheimer's features an interactive map that houses six informative topics, such as driving, wandering, and abuse and neglect. Complete all topics to earn a certificate, or simply review those most relevant to your role. Start at the briefing for tips and information that can help in any situation. Then, hear from other first responders and learn how to respond to typical calls. In each topic, you'll take a quiz yourself to test your new knowledge of the new tips. If you'd like to learn more, you can explore all the topics in greater detail. Start preparing today and make sure your first response is the right response. Visit alz.org slash first responders to register for the Approaching Alzheimer's First Responder Training. And I'm just, we have just one more. We have, a, I know we just had five to 10 minutes, so we have just a little bit more and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, Jody. And the new facts and figures will let you know that uh, it's no longer 5 million Americans. It's now nearly 7 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. Do you know what clues to look for if you encounter someone who might be wandering do you know how to respond to a driving incident with someone with dementia or how to respond to someone who unknowingly walks out of a store without paying? Do you know how to move a person from danger and help keep them calm in evacuation situations or how to respond to situations of abuse or neglect for someone living with dementia? These are the topics covered in the first responder training. Next slide. This training allows you to hear from other first responders and learn how to respond to typical calls for people living with dementia. The training also includes a downloadable tip sheet. This handy page can be folded into a visor or your emergency kit and includes helpful phone numbers and strategies to help a person living with dementia and their family. Make your first response the right response. Thank you. All right. We're happy to take your questions. I put my um, email address up there for you if anyone would like, you know, for follow up. Um, yeah. Are there, are, do you have any questions, anything that we can answer for you um, from the association? I just have one question, Tori. How many total hours of continuing education would this training uh, provide? One. It's just one hour. One. It's, yeah. Okay. And it can, be, it, it can also be done in blocks. So say, you know, someone wants to do the training, but they only have 10 minutes at a time or 15 minutes, it can be done in each of those different segments. It saves the progress. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And just from a process perspective, we do have a uh, section on our website where we link kind of all the training, just like the fall injury, uh, fall prevention training that we just approved. We have sections in there where we can upload training and share that resource. Absolutely. I wanted to congratulate you on that, by the way. I watched the fall training and I was like, this is great. This is great. All right. Any other questions from the committee or comments about providing the training on our website? 
that this was on our agenda like a decade ago to get Alzheimer's training and stuff going. And so I think anything you can get on there, especially if you're for the first responders, is they have. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Okay. Hearing no further comments, I think I can take this one to a vote as well. So all in favor of approving adding this training links on our website, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Thank you all for your presentations. Thank you for having us. Take care. All right, moving on to another action item. Uh, discuss the minute approve update to the 2024 Leave Behind Naloxone training. This is attachment 5B e in your packet, and I will take a motion to discuss. So moved. Yes. Right. Second. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I think Josh has a list of the updates. Is that true? Do you want me to run through the updates? I have the list in front of me. So. Yeah, that'd be helpful. So this, this is uh, already approved training that's already posted and available. There are only five changes to this. Uh, the graphic update on page 12 was updated to include 2023 data. Uh, the graphic update on page four was updated to include 2023 data. <laughs> uh, page 25, uh, paradigm shift, that slide was removed and the feedback we obtained uh, included that it was outdated, used outdated terminology. Uh, page 26, a link was added for testimonials from EMS-based fire personnel about giving out uh, Narcan, uh, beefing up that as a applicable resource. Um, and finally, last but not least, on page 52, a video was added, uh, which links uh, to the CDC uh, prepared video on how to use Narcan spray. It's just a high quality, professionally done video available uh, by the CDC. Other than that, there were no other changes to this. This is really an update refresh that we'll go through on an annual basis for the least behind our country. Thank you, Josh. I just had one comment. Um, uh, the QR code instruction, um, one of the last slides says, what do you do when you leave an Arctic kit? Instruct the patient, instruct the family, drop the, the uh, kit with the person. Um, use the line of letting the EMT person scan the QR code. A quick one liner. And then if the training uh, outlives the QR code, we could eventually just remove that one line. Perfect. I think that's an easy, friendly amendment if that's okay by the committee. I'm um, I think it would be on this how to leave the sign off from the lot. So it would just be there the use of that scan the QR code. That's what you're thinking. Probably 52. The one being displayed right now. Correct. Yes. All right. For that suggestion, are there any other discussion? All right, uh, hearing none, I will take this one to a vote as well. I'm all in favor of accepting the minor revisions as presented with the addition of the QR code. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. Uh, next item on here is uh, item F, review and approve AD quality, chest pain, stroke, and traumatic brain injury quality improvement. Toolkits. So there are three attachments, uh, F1, F2, and F3 in your packet. So can I get a motion to uh, discuss and approve this? No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll give you the background on this. I won't walk through the individual toolkits as they're quite detailed. Uh, the background on this project is uh, the Center for Rural Health at the University of Arizona receives a small grant called the EMS Flex Supplement Grant to help five rural EMS agencies implement quality improvement benchmarking programs at their agencies. Uh, our team at the U of A uh, went through that grant process. Um, we implemented some benchmarking programs for those small agencies 
Um, and then the final part of that grant is to share the toolkits, uh, the essentially how-to guides with the rest of the state of Arizona. Um, so we have those toolkits uh, in front of you all today. These are meant to be a resource that can be used by an individual at an EMS agency when they go to start a quality improvement program. So if I've just been deemed the QI captain for my small agency, I would go to the DHS website, click on this, and walk through how do I set up a chest pain quality improvement program? Which uh, codes am I going to look for? Uh, how would I graph those out? Um, we have toolkits for chest pain, stroke, and I'm blanking on the other one. TBF. TBF, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hannon did all of these, so full credit to Dr. Hannon and the rest of the team at the U of A. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, take suggestions for those. I have a question. If approved, what page would you want to find it on? Uh, the, <laughs> there is there are currently um, quality improvement toolkits on the DHS website. I would imagine they would go right there with them. Good question, Joe. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually a good follow up. The another question that was brought to us was, well, how do I? If I'm the QI officer, how do I know how to use these toolkits? Um, Dr. Mary Knotts, who some of you may know at the University of Arizona, is currently preparing an online course uh, that will teach new quality improvement officers how to use these kits and implement them at their agencies. Uh, we expect to have that course available for you all to review and hopefully go through the same process at our next statutory meeting. That'll be a 15 hour CE class, so a little bit longer course. And no, I won't make you review all of those. Further discussion. So these were all built sort of with evidence based. And maybe just give a little bit of kind of this. The six, if you want to maybe give a little success or more about how the yeah. family. So actually, if you want to scroll it. down to the graphs, I think those graphs are worth a thousand words. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, for this one, um, sorry, I can't read that far away. EKG acquisition. These are chest pain benchmarks. Um, so you can see the black vertical line on each graph. Um, we collected retrospective data. Uh, obviously, the most impressive one is that 12 lead EKG one. Um, so prior to implementation of this project, um, you can see that whatever agency this was, I honestly don't know, um, was getting about 50% of their 12 lead EKGs um, after implementing some training um, and closed call rules so that their EPCR wouldn't let them close it out before they clicked the right box. You can see they improved their EKG acquisitions or this documentation of their EKG acquisition uh, to 100% in that post-intervention period. Um, so these do have some very strong impacts. Um, as we look at all of our funding agencies moving to a pay per performance model, um, this is how you hit that performance benchmarking. You can demonstrate that your EMS agency is meeting national benchmarks. Uh, these are all national standard benchmarks uh, for chest pain performance, stroke performance, all that stuff. Scroll down stroke data, Derek. can see stroke, finger sticks, blood glucose, last known well, the next one down. Um, and then there's one more below this. Oh, let me know, sorry. And we're gonna look at the TBI one real quick. We can take a look at those graphs. Um, so in traumatic brain injury, we all know from the EPIC trial, uh, some of these benchmarks are incredibly important with oxygen given. Um, going from 17 to 50 percent. Um, the next one, I believe, is was an ID place. Um, well, that's the only graph. So there are a couple others placement of Nathan VHX and administration of a fluid bolus uh, with your blood pressure as well. I, we sell these honestly to EMS agencies. This is about documenting the great work you already do. This is purely showing that you're a high performing agency.
any other questions or discussion? How do you have a time to kind of look through some of these? Thank you for presenting that, Justin. Yes. All right. Anyone online? Can you reference the uh, national metric that was used for this, or, or is there a way to add the reference page? So if agencies wanted to know where this, uh, looking specifically at the, at the chest pain and the aspirin, the 80% marker, where that KPI came from, or maybe a reference sheet might, might be awesome just to see how this document was derived. Yeah, that's very easy to do. These are all the compass measures. And for so those of you who are familiar with the compass measures, um, that'd be a great resource to add to the end. We can easily do that. That'd be great. Awesome document. Thank you for the feedback, Kyle. All right. So with that suggestion, I'm hearing no further discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll move this one to a vote as well. So we'll um, take these as written. I'm going to add, add the additional uh, reference to the EMS Compass Measures uh, project. Uh, so all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, sorry. Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. I locked my agenda. Uh, and then moving on to the next one, uh, discuss a minute of updates to the sepsis training. This is attachment 5G. Can I get a motion to discuss this item? Okay. Okay. Hey, Brian. Who is, who is the second on that one? Please. Oh, yes. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of changes to the sepsis. This is again one that's already um, in existence on the website as available training. Uh, we had gone through as a regular update process. Um, so going through this, I think maybe I'll just highlight the things that we changed. Um, I think some of the comments from the work group uh, were that some of the data was a little old, so we did go through and just update some of these graphs. Um, I don't know what happened to that one. I think it shows up weird in Google. Google. Yeah. The right one pulled up. We'll go back up a few slides. I don't know if this is the right one pulled up. This, is, yeah. this should have been the new graph, I believe. <coughs> Really good looking. Uh, yeah. Sorry, y'all may have the wrong attachment now. <laughs> There's not a ton of changes, but we can pull up and go through the details. The Charlie's shades and so I should have checked out the shirt. The Charlie's my fault, actually. I thought about looking to make sure, and I failed to do so. Okay. Okay. This is okay. What's what number is like? Uh. This yeah. one right here? Yes. Yeah. So if you scroll down, up one. Oh, sorry, other ways. That's data is fine. Yeah. yeah. So that's just a little bit updated data. And then the notes is the actual references to where the data came from. Uh, but really, it doesn't, not really any different. Just a little updated. Um, this is all the same. Let me test my memories. The same, Brian will have to help me. Memory better than mine. <laughs> well, you have a short for Brian. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to tell me no just about this me. I looked through it and I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> I was in here, so. Um, I think one thing I saw in there that I wasn't sure about is that there are some entitled CO2 references that I couldn't remember if we left it the way it was or whether we made them the same there it talks about an entitled CO2 of less than 32 but 
then there's another place where it talks about the entitled CO2 and and its relationships to, to lactic and exit. So yeah, I, I couldn't remember if we had just as for the ease of. I think we made them the same. I think we made them the same. Yeah, and so much of this is the same. We mostly just try to uh, update the data that was in here, the graph, and put in some new um, some new updated literature sources that were. Listed. This is updated disease mortality. Um, and then that one was existing. Uh, I think this is one, a couple of these are new references. Um, I think that one's a new one. And for those of us one. online, is there a way to put this in the chat where we can click on it? Uh, <laughs> you no. Know, it's definitely different than the one that's emailed. So I'm just, it's go, it's a pretty quick review. Yeah, there shouldn't be much change in there other than um, there's a couple things towards the end. Okay, thank you. And, and then the addition of a couple other studies in here just to highlight some newer literature on EMS and sepsis. And we scroll past these, these ones. Like the, the role in the EMS and the outcomes with early recognition is we'll see what these are. And this is the summary of all that literature, basically. That is no change. That is no change. And some of the numbers we made consistent. So this slide here has a change. It said something uh, about a goal set of something like 92 or so a different number than we generally use for, for things. So we just made that 94%. Uh, and then this, uh, it was previously listed at 22 cc's per kg goal list. Um, we made it match the TPTG 30 cc per kg. Uh, no change there. Yeah. yeah. Make sure the TTTGs were up to date here. One more for medic, I think. Uh, changes there. That one already said ninety four percent. I think the one you're talking about, Brian, is after this line, so the pit bull. It's entitled CO2. Um, it had a different number in there. Right? Oh, no, it's 25. I thought it was quite, I thought it was higher than that, though, where they talked about the entitled CO2 being 32. It was, I thought it was earlier on than that. Now I'd have to search for it. Then maybe we I just deleted it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And really, we mostly just tried to update some of the data and make it more current and then change anything that was inconsistent with the current TTTG. We just took that number off, right? Maybe that's Very what good. we did, and then we just had the, the reference for yeah. the 25, we end up at 6.1. So. I'm pretty sure that hand out your coins with carpets. What's that? I hand out your coins with carpets. 
I know, I'm trying to see what it was. Oh, that one last. Yeah, there weren't any other changes to like content on any of the other slides, really. Ninety-nine percent the same. All right. Any other comments or questions? He added a few references in the notes section. The folks looking for references to the data, that sort of thing. Questions, comments? Thank you again to the committee for their help in this one. Anyone online have further comment before I close it up? All right, hearing none, uh, I'll call for a vote on this one. Uh, all in favor of accepting uh, this training, the one that Shelly has put up, not the one in your favor. Say aye. 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 Any opposed, any? All right, moving on to, we have three more agenda items. Uh, the next one is discuss the and approve the for the uh, chest and personal only GPR training. Uh, do I have a motion to discuss this? Mm -hmm. I take Brian and who second? Matt. Yeah. Uh, and this was, was this from yours, Matt? Yeah. Okay. I did not um, include. The, I didn't print this out because I only had half of the data update that were requested. Uh, mostly it was just updates to some of the data that was really old. So update to that slide and the new graphs shows the black mark of COVID. Mm -hmm. And then the sudden cardiac arrest data on the next slide um, was all updated. Again, it looks like with the new citation as well. Uh, yeah. Those are pretty much the big changes. Then a little further down, there was the Arizona bystander CPR that I was hoping to get Arizona updated data for that, which it looks like this is still the old data. So I don't know yeah, if we're I able to get. Um, we had questions about the source of, lots of questions about the source of the data and what um, we she wanted to keep it the same. I'm not sure if she does. Oh, no. So. Since we still have been working on the shared transmission, we can't pull. Okay. If it's from the share registry, we wouldn't be able to pull the most recent data. So I get. So um, I think that was her question. On us. Do, what, do we know what year this one came from? From 2017. I mean, would we? I mean, would it be good to just put a general slide in about bystanders CPR rate in general from the state versus just. <laughs> Versus yeah. comparing different types of CPR, I don't know. I think that probably put just something updated. That's. I think she her fear was that if somebody looked at this and then looked at a new graph and assumed they were from these same data source that they weren't and they were seeing different things, that was the main concern. I think since this led to Amber's point, I think some people put, maybe we need to just change the whole slide in terms of yeah. looking at just what bystander CPR performed. Period versus type of CPR. Just yeah, I think that's where things are very different now than back in 2010 when that data was pulled. But uh, we can also work on pulling that. I think we should have the share for 2022 that should have a bystander CPR with them. I think that's the annual report. They yeah. pull that data mm -hmm. so we can look at that um, and just see if we can maybe pull that data to take this slide. Something newer than 2010. Yeah, yeah. no, I think it's, it's a good point. It's, you know, the question we get a lot from field providers and sometimes agencies do we need to document when is this way anymore because we all just have to talk the same way. And you know, I think the way we teach it now is very different than what was back then when the data, the 2010 data was from many years before that. And so we are in a different place in terms of how we treat uh, cardiac arrest. So it might be reasonable for this one. We just look at replacing the whole data mm -hmm. slides of just bytes or CPR. 
So do we okay. want to do we want to table this one then? So we have some new data to share. Okay. Just a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, in the appendix, there's some references to some studies, although I think one of these may be up front also. But then there's a repeat of what to do and the pictures of Dr. Evie performing depressions, which is also earlier in the uh, in the slide set. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it's beneficial to have that twice in the appendix. And the other thing I was curious about is there's a reference to uh, stroke assessment using the FAST score back in here. And if that is going to be an important part of this, do we maybe really want to put it up where it's not in the appendix so that you don't know it's in the, if you don't look at the appendix, you don't know it's there. I don't know what the intent necessarily of that was at the time. And then the only other question I had is, I know this isn't, isn't MICR, MICR, or CCR, but it's, it ha it doesn't really go anywhere that I could find it to hear that trauma is not necessarily indicated for CCR, MICR, but since this is kind of chest compression only for leg providers, right? And that's maybe not worth it to go there or that it doesn't matter because you you're gonna do it anyway. Because it does talk about respiratory stuff in here, maybe not being appropriate for it. So that's all that I have. I think in labor training, budget. I generally try to keep out anything that's confusing and right. keep it very simple. Uh, I think I really try to get away from the CPR and I think it's confusing people at this point. And uh, our, in the TCGs, we really focus more on the high quality chest compression and then delineating in the guideline based on what you think geology is with some type of airway management. I think from this perspective of kind of the level that it's trained at, it would probably be hard to I think it would be fine. I don't think there's only really enough features in this we need to bring back I think uh, just to make sure it's the data element. Okay. But I think it's a great point uh I think if we were kind of showing that we needed to update some of the <laughs> the very updated data that's in here. Okay, so first question, um, do we want to take a motion to table? So Matt, any seconds for that? Great. Um, all in favor of tabling this, uh, so we have a time to sort of revisit some of the data, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Great, and then I guess I have a second question. Does this require a maybe work group to take a look at it, or do we want to just come back uh, to the committee with some new data? Question for the committee. Are they going to uh, incorporate Brian's decision? Yeah, I think the difference would be we either have get some data or place some data on the slide from the DHF um, or share um, and just bring it back as is, or um, maybe have the work group sit down and go more thoroughly through it and uh, make some further recommendations. Those would be the sort of different routes we could go with this. My recommendation just update. Um all of this, the uh, statistics and then um, uh, it looks fine. I mean, I've, I've been using that slide, the old one anyway, um, for quite a while. So just updating statistics because I know that has changed. Okay, thank you, Orlando, for that comment. <clears throat> um, Okay, but I still don't think we need to take another uh, motion for that. There's so much to the All right, so let's bring this back to uh, the later date. Moving on, um, item I discussed article two through four EMS training and certification rules from our March 14th meeting. I think we have, I don't know, about maybe 15 minutes. So, yes. Gail, do you want to sure. make any specific intro? Uh, so it was a big thank you to everyone on the committee that participated in our work group uh, last week. We had great uh, feedback from committee members as well as from the public. I think it was really good discussion and good opportunity to get feedback from this group, which really represents the education community of Rockford State. Uh, we wanted to just uh, open up to anyone who felt like they didn't get to have any statements at that meeting to gather a little bit more public feedbacks 
And then uh, we did kind of pulling together all the feedback to that committee. Anything additional we grab today, we'll have an internal meeting with the host uh, that's told the next draft rules uh, within the next couple of weeks. So maybe two weeks of better instrument. Want to say what things have uh, come back? You want to mention journaling? All right. <laughs> so we will, the goal will be the next, uh, you know, trying to get this really out there as we, uh, people don't guess what we discussed. I think sometimes we reach on the next session of Sagat. So uh, I'll, that's kind of a little bit of background and then I'll just go to the question. Yeah. The new draft and the new public comment period, is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. The plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But if there's any questions or any feedback that people want to be considered for the draft, that'll be coming out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I actually had something that came up after the meeting when we were talking about it. Um, is there's kind of a loophole in there in the way we have it set up as far as uh, as far as critical care certification is it says and, and not the training program, but just say your grandfather Dan, you're already a critical care medic. So one of the our medics said, hey, so all I need to do is go and take the online written test, and then I can automatically get put in. And so technically, because we don't have a criteria for that, if that's what we're using is just a certificate, you can go in and take the online test at any point if you just study the book. And there's no written criteria that you have to have 40 hours of clinical training or something else. So you can have somebody who's really book smart who's never stepped foot right in respiratory therapy or an ICU or anything else like that. So I don't know if we want to add in the, you know, you either have to take it from a recognized program or you could be grandfathered in with X number of years of experience plus your CT, uh, CTP, or you've taken the test and you've documented X number of hours of clinical training. I think there are two years of the paramedic. You have to have two years of the paramedic. Right. For so, certification. And then, I, you know, there it's kind of similar to National Registry. So the National Registry channel can challenge the exam, not take a paramedic program, and if they pass the National Registry, they can then come get a certification in Arizona, and once they have National Registry certifications. Uh, so I think it's similar to that. I think that this whole key is trying to list what an approved course. As you know, we have we'll have to approve the requirements to be a training program. The feedback that I've heard from, I don't know, I haven't done, taken the test, but from anyone that has, that it's a very good full of exams. So yeah. <laughs> not this one book. Yeah, no. it is <laughs> many, many hours. <laughs> 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 yeah. I wouldn't have it for sure. Yeah. 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 It'd be kind of impossible to do it without really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of studying. Even those that take an actual course end up buying many, many additional resources and doing a whole bunch of extra studying on blood gas analysis. It just, I mean, it's, oh. it's a lot of study. So, and I think in practice now, the uh, critical care paramedics that do operate in the state, not under a expanded scope, but have their CCP, um, I, I think the requirements are kind of the same for them. So that they have their the test that they took. Um, yeah, good question. Yes. That's okay. These are all in support of what was said uh, last meeting, but I'll reiterate just to get the opportunity. Um, I really do support the option to integrate alternative learning techniques into our training curriculum, uh, particularly asynchronous learning to count towards that training time. Um, uh, there was some discussion about the duration of EMT training in particular. Um, expanding the duration of EMT training would increase the cost to students of um, a, completing a course, particularly for the courses that I run. Um, so uh, charging students another thousand bucks, 550 bucks, uh, or an extra 10 hours of training, uh, 20 hours of training could place a financial burden on our students and reduce the number of students who enroll in that uh, program. Um, I know we also discussed field time. Uh, the need to do 10 hours in the field and uh, 10 patients encounters. Many people on the call believe it's the same concern. Um, I'll put my Tucson fire hat on. We don't have that much field time to give our students. We cannot do that. Um, four hours is about as much as we can give to each EMT student that wants, wants it in our system. Um, so reducing that time uh, requirement would be helpful. Um, in addition to allowing um, students to do simulated patient encounters and write up patient care reports based on those simulated patient encounters would uh, reduce the burden of training on our uh, EMTs and paramedics who are trying to 
get their job done in a busy system. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I thought it's a hand up on the side or that just. All right, there are no other comments. Anyone online who would like to make a comment? All right, hearing none, I'll move on to our next uh, agenda item. Uh, this is a standing item. We just we have an ongoing list of, of training modules that we uh, just keep so that we can monitor and track when we renew them, and we'll add things to other uh, ideas come up. Um, item number six: uh, We have any agenda items to be considered for the next meeting? Uh, please let us know or uh, send a note to Shelley. Uh, next call to the public. Hearing none, I will just uh, highlight that we have some upcoming events here. It's a fairly long list of things that are upcoming. And these are also listed on the DHS website uh, for those of you wanting to go back and check these out later. Uh, our next meeting is going to be July 18th at 1030. And with that, we can adjourn. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.